so this is a webinar and it's a, a special meeting. Uh, thank you all for joining it. Uh, first of all, I guess, welcome back to the semester at HGS, this um, strange and challenging uh, and historic <laughs> semester. Um, so David Holland and I were talking over the summer. Dave, Professor Holland is, teaches theories and methods, and I teach, teach IMS. And we were speaking about um, we were speaking about ways that we could approach this term differently, apart from the obvious, especially uh, in the wake of uh, the racist violence that has that we've seen in our country over the past several months, and the protests, the peaceful protests in response, uh, and especially in light of the last week, events in Kenosha and uh, in Portland, the, the, the shooting of Jacob Blake, and then the follow on violence. Um, we are glad to have this conversation, but not just this conversation, also all your participation and our, you know, our, our collective resolve to, to respond, not just with conversation, but with action. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you for being part of this. Um, uh, this conversation and the topic is it today's topic is you know loosely gathered around uh, white supremacy and the study and practice of ministry this you know what we what I would normally be doing at this hour would be teaching the first class of instruction ministry studies to the incoming cohort of MDiv students um, but we wanted to broaden the conversation make this our first topic of conversation broaden it and also invite some distinguished colleagues uh, and faculty members to, to come join us and help us have this conversation. So this is going to run as a Zoom webinar, which I have not moderated before, so we'll see how this goes. But um, uh, each of our panelists, who I'll introduce in a moment, are going to speak for uh, a few minutes each, for, you know, somewhere between eight to 10 or 12 or something minutes each, uh, with remarks based upon that topic. Uh, and then we will open the 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 forum up or the webinar up for questions from the 119 others of you so far who have gathered for this conversation there are a couple of ways that we'll be able to do that if you'd like to speak out loud um, you can request to, to you can raise your hand and i can i can allow you to talk or there's also at the bottom of your zoom screen there's a, a q a button and you can type your questions in so when you know after about the first hour of this forum uh, or slightly less, I guess. Uh, when we open it up for questions, if you would like to pose a question to the panel or make a comment, please either either use the Q and A function to type in a question, or raise your hand, and I can I can um, uh, unmute your your microphone and you can speak to us generally. Okay. So I'm going to introduce our our panelists now, uh, and then we'll we'll turn to them um, uh, directly. We have uh, five uh, colleagues from our faculty here with us today, Cheryl Giles, who's the Francis Greenwood Peabody Senior Lecturer on Pastoral Care and Counseling, Karen King, the Hollis Professor of Divinity, Usman Khan, the Prince Awali bin Talal Professor of Contemporary Islamic Religion and Society, also the Professor of African and African American Studies in FAS, and he's also the Denominational Counselor to Muslim students in, um, in our uh, uh, MDiv program. Dan McCannon, who is Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Senior Lecturer in Divinity, and Michelle Sanchez, who's Associate Professor of, of Theology. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about why I invited these folks. It's first because they're, they're friends and colleagues of mine whose work I really respect uh, and who I've worked with, all of whom I've worked with before. Um, uh, but also because I thought that their perspective on this, particularly the question of white supremacy and, and ministry or ministry, ministry formation, the study of ministry, the practice of ministry, each approach this question from you know, different professional obligations and interests, but all I think bring something to it in a way that I personally wanted to hear from all of them. And so I thought they would be the ones that, that I would um, invite all of us to hear from. Uh, I also wanted to say just one other word about the, the panel that I've gathered for today. You know, we have, we have a lot of people on our faculty and uh, not just on the Divinity School faculty, but across the university who could speak really directly to the question of white supremacy um, and, uh, and white supremacy in ministry. Our convocation speaker, speaker tomorrow, Cornell, Cornell Brooks, uh, I think will do this and could do this um, for us here, Cornell West, others. Who, who speak directly to these questions in their work and whom I encourage you to, to seek out and reach out to if you want to work more with this. But um, I, was also, I also really wanted to, this was important to me this summer as I was planning this, I, I, I wanted to make sure that I did not comprise a panel only of people of color because the work of battling white supremacy is 
is the task and responsibility of white people. And so I wanted white people on this panel. And, um, and so I'm glad for the participation of all our panelists. Um, and this is not, this is not a, a limited set. There are many, many at our school and across the university who can speak to these issues. Um, but these five are the ones I wanted to hear from and I'm looking forward to hear from. And so I'm gonna stop talking so we can hear from them. So our first speaker will be uh, Cheryl and I'm gonna mute myself and um, ask my other panelists to mute themselves and um, Cheryl, please. So thank you for the invitation, Matt, and I'm uh, happy to join my colleagues, colleagues in having this conversation. Uh, wow, this is agonizingly, this is very difficult to do. Uh, Try to sort of, frame what were the most important things for me to talk about. And uh, I thought I'd, I'd talk about what's heavy on my heart. Um, as you know, and for those of you that are in your first year, I've been teaching at Harvard Divinity School since for about 23 years. And I'm also a graduate of uh, an alum, uh, having uh, received an MDiv uh, back in the 70s. Uh, the whole process of uh, white supremacy, anti-racism uh, practices, has been going on for many years. Uh, and um, now we find ourselves at a unique point uh, having uh, at least a double uh, pandemic, uh, coronavirus and uh, anti-racism um, uh, practices and rebellion. Uh, I am heartened by the rebellion. It feels like we're at a different point than we've been at before. It feels different than the 60s. Uh, there were different things at stake during the 60s. But certainly now, uh, uh, it's heartening for me to see so many um, uh, uh, non-black, uh, non. So many. It's heartening for me to see so many white people uh, part of the uh, Black Lives Move Matter uh, protests. So all of which to say is one. I've been. I'm on sabbatical this semester and been doing uh, for the year actually, and been. I've been doing a lot of reading, uh, and I recommend uh, Begin Again by Eddie Gloud. He talks about his focus is talk, uh, sort of renewing or reviving James Baldwin's. Uh, ideas and uh, about uh, race. And also I wanna sort of uh, give a shout out to the book, My Grandmother's Hands by Risma Menachem, which I think is fabulous. So having said all that, I wanna start with a quote from um, uh, Baldwin and I wanna share some, some, some uh, brief uh, snapshots of things that are on my heart. And if there are questions later, I'm happy to engage or some of my colleagues might pick, up, pick them up. So Baldwin, as you know, was a, a, a sort of an astute um, visionary uh, writer who uh, constantly looked at race and the interaction of, uh, uh, of, of the racial tension in the United States, uh, some of, many of which he experienced as a queer gay man, as he redundant, many of which he experienced as a queer man, uh, and also as someone who also was um, at least began his early life deep as a uh, really committed Christian. And some of those things came into tension. Uh, one of the quotes that he um, um, wrote that I found particularly interesting is, is this. He said, uh, it is entirely up to the American people whether or not they are going to try to find out, find out in their own hearts why it was necessary to have a nigger in the first place. And the future of the country depends on that. Now, that's exactly where we are right now. You know. Uh, and the work that we need to do is going to take more than just understanding anti-racism practice or anti-racism. All of our students, all of you are smart. Uh, you, you're able to eloquently talk about uh, anti-racism, intersectionality. I hear it in my classes. I've heard you in other conversations. But it, it's bigger than that. And uh, I want to reach out to you today to talk about uh, some things that are really important to me and that I think are necessary to kind of shift this, to move into a phase of transformation from where we are now. And one is that we need to train our attention to notice and remember. Uh, I think noticing is, is difficult because we tend to live in our heads and remembering, we certainly don't want to remember. So for example, for, for 400 years ago, uh, we've, for 400 years, we have lived with the contradictory method that black bodies are strong and vulnerable and frightening to white bodies and white bodies are fragile, vulnerable, especially to black bodies. So that dichotomy is something that, we've, we've, that was put in place uh, early on, uh, about 1619 or thereafter, uh, when 
uh, colonialism really started to take root and uh, the seeds of white supremacy were there. And most of you, if you read your history, I think it's important to go back to do some reading around history. Uh, a lot of the um, attempts to uh, enslave people, particularly enslaved black people, had to do with money. It was an economic uh, uh, project that turned into a machine that allowed people to get wealthy. Uh, so the whole enterprise of uh, enslavement, it was, was a corporation in, in those days. And as, you think, as we think about uh, systemic racism, white, uh, white supremacy, we, we need to really look back at the roots. Uh, and with this whole notion of how white bodies look, there was a con um, another contradictory um, myth around black bodies and that the job of black bodies was to care for white bodies, to soothe them, protect them, and particularly from black bodies. Now that's a little bit, uh, again, a little bit of attention because those, the, the black bodies that were initially enslaved were bodies that were both um, uh, plowing the, the soil, picking cotton, preparing food, washing clothes, laundering clothes, taking care of children. So they, black, early black folks were is both taking care of nurturing folks as well as being despised at the same time. Uh, this whole notion of white fragility is uh, something that we, that uh, Robin D'Angelo has written about more recently but it's, a, a more, it's more of an immediate defensive posture whenever a white body is challenged on the subject of race inequality or equity. So you ask, if you say to any white person you know, that they're racist, they'll crumble. I mean, you get the tears profusely and not just women, they're people are deeply hurt. And they're hurt because they feel like they've done something. But if you kind of scratch the surface a little bit more, most white people will say, well, I, I had nothing to do, this, do with this. This is long before I ever got here. Uh, but the truth of the matter, and my point is, is and I'm going to try to make it over and over again, is that both white bodies and black bodies have a long history of being traumatized. And that trauma is, is settled in the body. And that's what we have to, we have different challenges around this, but that's what we have to work out of in order to transform uh, the kind of culture and the society that we have now. Uh, white fragility is reflexive, protective. It's a way for the white body to avoid experience the, experiencing the pain of historical trauma inflicted by other white bodies. So those early colonists, the work that they did in setting up this sort of machine around slavery, picking cotton, and the wealth that they uh, accrued from that, all those things, those are, those are, you know, if you think of the word epi epigenetics, those were passed on historically through your grandparents, your mother, your father, great grandparents, in the same way that for African Americans, we have a different legacy uh, that shows up in different ways in our bodies. And uh, I think we pay a lot of attention, uh, particularly in terms of um, the struggle around white people to understand um, white supremacy and anti-racism, uh, that it, it's, it's a cognitive process, but one of the reasons I, I think that it's, it's been here uh, so long and become systemic is that we don't ever get to the point where we're talking about how to transform the kind of embodied white supremacy uh, that you, you, you live in. And I'm talking, speaking to white people now. Uh, and black people have another challenge around, you know, transforming the historical intergenerational trauma that we've experienced and, and ways in which we've reacted to that. Uh, I think this is really an important point. Uh, I'm just, some of these readings, uh, the things that I've been reading have come from people like Rachel, Rachel Yehuda, who was one of the first persons, uh, first people to start researching uh, um, she's a Jewish woman who started researching the history of Nazism and, um, and how that the, the experience of, 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 um, of having parents, grandparents um, in the Holocaust, that whole experience was passed on from generation to generation, even though the, the, um, the uh, future generations were far removed from the Holocaust, that, that those, some of the same anxiety was res resided in their bodies. So uh, she, she's been at the forefront of, of this conversation and, and, and research, and uh, it's pretty important. So one of the ways that, in terms of the fragility, uh, fragility is trauma-driven. Uh, and so if for most white people, there's a kind of defensiveness that quickly turns into fight, flight, or freeze. Neuroscientists have been really talking about this, researching this, uh, this for quite a while now. And it, it, so basically what I'm saying is that when you, people become defensive, it triggers off something in the brain that says, oh, I got to find a place to, to create, find safety. Uh, and so that might be, I don't want to talk about it. That might be uh, saying, you know, just leaving. It might be in a sort of a freeze frame. 
in most most people don't want to be judged, uh, and I think we're too both everyone is too um, focused on trying to protect what they think is 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 at risk in the moment, and so it's very difficult to have these conversations. Uh, I think the way out for white people is to you know own your own whiteness and uh, begin to understand the historical legacy of white supremacy and that it lives in the body. In other words, it's throughout generations, it keeps showing up again and again. You don't have to do anything. It just happened, you're born with it and it keeps, but the, one of the things that's really important is recognizing the white, your power as recognizing your whiteness. And we know that you know race is a social construct, but the, that whiteness um, also has a historical trauma that needs to be transformed. Um, that means for white folks accepting, exploring, and mending the trauma in order to dismantle systemic racism. Now, I really believe that without doing this work, we're not going anywhere. We can sort of understand cognitively, uh, linguistically, in all the various ways, philosophically, how um, uh, understand uh, um, white supremacy, racism. But I think we've been scratching at the surface for a long time. Without, because we really have not uh, understood how this has been embodied in us and in the ways that we need to, to transform that. To transform that. Um, and as we know, without a clear and present focus on body trauma, uh, the whole question of systemic racism and white supremacy really can't be fu fully addressed. So um, when white people begin to address white body supremacy, they can begin to learn and feel the impact of white supremacy, meaning the undoing of it. Because what happens is we uh, is that our social activism takes on a different flavor. It takes on a, a, a different impact. Uh, and that, that the, um, the embodiment of, of, of white racism uh, and working that through is the beginning of, of a practice to heal. Uh, and likewise, the same thing, again, is true for African-American folks of people of color, but, but the work that needs to be done is really different. So I just want to underscore that, that, that from my, my point, uh, usually teaching uh, spiritual care and counseling, uh, and trauma, a lot of trauma courses now, and also counseling courses. In both courses, I focus a lot on mindfulness uh, uh, as a standalone, uh, this mindfulness, being mindful of who you are, where you are, what you're about. And this takes work. This is not something that, you know, can live in your head. Mindfulness comes from living in your body, so you know really what's going on and what's happening. So, for example, a half hour before this was about to start, I was thinking about this forever. I had lots of different ideas. Finally was able to write them down. And then I had a headache, I had a headache a half hour before this. And I thought, oh, what is this going on? And I just stopped for a moment. I thought, okay, you're anxious. And what am I anxious about? Well, about a lot of things, right? This, this is a hard conversation in some ways. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about for a very, very long time. And uh, at times it's been hard for me to stay in this conversation because I've got, in terms of reactivity, fight, fly, or freeze, I get that, I, st I, get, I stand in the fight, I have a fight stance and ready to sort of defend, take on, uh, and that will happen. There's no perfect way to do this, but I guess what I'm trying to advocate or suggest or implore is that we really look at somatic practices. What's, what's happening in the body for each of us? What's coming up? You see, you're walking down the city street, you see somebody cross the street, you see, you, you're walking down the street, you see a black person on the street, you decide to cross the street. What's, what's going on in that moment? Uh, and it can't, this is really a practice that you have to be attuned to every day. Uh, and so one of the things I thought about is what can I recommend? I recommend, recommended two books, but I also recommended something that I'm going to start today, even though I've been thinking and reading about this for a long time, which is a, a racial healing uh, um, journal, which is to make, is, is to, in my daily practice, I meditate every day, but that doesn't mean that I'm always attuned to what's happening in my body, is to begin to work on this, after this conversation, a racial uh, healing journal, is to write about what feelings show, came up for me during the day as I was moving through the day. Uh, was I anxious? Was I, you know, afraid? Was I holding back? Was holding back is all, also another thing, which we don't, we don't stand up for what we see and what we know. We kind of hang back because we don't want to be judged or whatever. So I'll, I'll end there because we have four other speakers. Uh, but uh, I, so my, my point is really has to do with trauma that lives in the body, white bodies and black bodies, and for us to begin to work on somatic process, uh, practices that can really help us heal and uh, begin the process of transformation. I think without that, uh, tackling uh, white supremacy and systemic practices is just gonna have us on a treadmill going nowhere. So thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I, I hear a lot of echoes of uh, Resma Menachem's book in your, in your comments. And um, we, um, we required that book for IMS this fall. So um, I know I have, we have a lot of first year IMS students mm -hmm. 
uh, in the room right now, so I'm sure they'll have a lot of questions for you. So thank you, Cheryl, for um, your comments. Uh, Dan. Yes, um, hello everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, thank you, Matt and David, for using um, the power that you have um, teaching our introductory courses to galvanize this community-wide conversation. Thank you, Cheryl, for the ways you're helping us really think about the traumas in our bodies uh, that influence the way we react uh, in um, when challenged to transform uh, long-standing structures. And thanks to everybody who came to this event. Uh, this is really a chance uh, for us to do this work as a community in ways where we hold one another accountable. And that wouldn't happen um, without lots and lots of us here together. So I'm very, very grateful. Uh, I've begun to get to know some of you who are new students uh, in my role as chair of the MTS committee, uh, but today I'm going to speak out of uh, the other role that I hold here. Um, as Emerson Senior Lecturer, I have a particular responsibility to uphold the historic connection between the Divinity School and the Unitarian Universalist tradition, uh, which in part was born right here at Harvard Divinity School. And this double accountability to a particular faith tradition as well as to our school uh, gives me a comparative vantage point on our national conversation about undoing white supremacy because I'm participating in these conversations in the context of two institutions that are very different in some respects but also deeply related. Uh, so what I'm going to do with my time is to share a little bit of the Unitarian Universalist story of grappling uh, with white supremacy uh, as a way of perhaps shedding some comparative insights on our work at Harvard Divinity School and the work that all of you are doing in various uh, specific faith traditions. It often happens uh, that a crucial conversation emerges in the wake of a specific event that exposes longstanding structural problems. Uh, this obviously is what happened with our current national conversation, uh, which was sparked by uh, the murder of George Floyd, even though it was one in a line of murders that goes back, uh, as Cheryl was saying, uh, to 1619 in the United States, North American context, but back even further centuries in a broader global context. Likewise, the current Unitarian Universalist conversation about white supremacy has been focused on a single event uh, that happened in 2017. Uh, this was an event in which uh, um, uh, a, a controversy over a hiring decision. At the time, our denominational president, Peter Morales, was Latino but um, almost everyone else in a top position of leadership in the denomination was uh, a white person. Uh, most of them ordained, most of them male, even though most uh, UU religious professionals then and now uh, were not, did not identify as male. When yet another top position was filled by a white ordained man, uh, President Morales was questioned at a gathering for religious professionals of color uh, when he responded by saying that the problem was with the pipeline, there weren't enough qualified candidates, uh, uh, a Latina religious educator publicly shared her story of having applied for the job, been told she was fully qualified, uh, but not receiving it. Uh, President Morales responded awkwardly and the controversy intensified uh, to the point where ultimately he resigned, the person who made the hiring decision resigned, two other top leaders resigned, and we realized we really needed to have a deeper conversation across our tradition uh, to try to find out if we could start doing things uh, differently. Now, currently, uh, Harvard Divinity School is not in a crisis like that, a crisis focused on a particular thing. Uh, at least not yet. And it's interesting to reflect on that not yet. Part of our Unitarian Universalist crisis was the realization that having a person of color in one top leadership position 
did not magically make white supremacy go away. So in some ways it was the same challenge that the United States as a whole faced during the Barack Obama presidency where so many people had invested so many hopes in what he individually could do and realized the work that needed to be done needed to be shared much more broadly. Uh, and part of the reason HDS doesn't have that particular crisis is we haven't even reached that point in our institutional history. All of the deans who have served HDS have been white men from Christian backgrounds. All Harvard presidents have been white, all of them men with one exception. So thinking about the UU parallel, it's reasonable to assume uh, that as we take further steps on this journey at the Divinity School, we're likely to get more uncomfortable, not less. And we need to be ready for that discomfort and ready to find the ways in which discomfort generates creative new thinking. And I'm gonna run through a list of creative things uh, that have happened in Unitarian Universalism that reflect the kind of possibility that can be born of discomfort. Uh, one creative thing was a series of events called the White Supremacy Teach-Ins, where religious educators really took the lead in inviting every congregation, and the vast majority of congregations did participate in this, uh, to start having those deeper conversations, um, engaging the issues of trauma uh, that Cheryl was just talking about. Another creative step is a practice that often is attached to the word centering. Uh, which is the discipline uh, that happens when a community starts paying attention to those people within the community who have previously been at the margins. Uh, so when Unitarian Universalists gather nationally in our General Assembly for the past few years since the crisis, there's always been a moment when all of the people of color who are present uh, are invited in some way to move to a more visible space. And this is a hall with thousands of people in it. Uh, so among those thousands, you suddenly see hundreds of people uh, um, from previously marginalized communities together on the stage at the center of attention, giving the lie to all of the ideas about, well, there's not enough or we can't find the right pool or so forth. Yes, we're here. There's a, there's a visible uh, presentation of that. Uh, that challenges everyone to think differently. Uh, another piece of creative new thinking uh, has to do with the way we tell our history. And uh, um, I'm trained primary, primarily as a historian. I serve on the board of the UU History and Heritage Society. So this is very uh, crucial to me. Uh, uh, many congregations have started telling the difficult stories of the way in which our beginnings are tied up with the history of slavery in this country. Uh, and this is shattering some really big myths, uh, particularly the myth that slavery was an exclusively Southern phenomenon. Unitarian Universalism historically is a denomination that has been strongest in New England. Uh, in the past, we told a lot of heroic stories about the abolitionist sentiments of our congregations during the 19th century. Now we're learning to tell the stories of how our congregations were deeply involved in the system of slavery that existed in New England for about 200 years in the 17th and 18th centuries and how the endowments uh, that continue to sustain Unitarian Universalist work to this day were built on a foundation of the appropriation of land from indigenous communities and the appropriation of labor uh, uh, from enslaved Africans. Uh, obviously the parallel to Harvard is quite intense here. Uh, Harvard also benefits from a longstanding endowment uh, founded as American capitalism as a whole is founded on the practices of land theft uh, and enslavement. Uh, the final creative thing uh, that we've been doing in Unitarian Universalism is reconfiguring our national leadership to reflect the community that we want to become. Uh, uh, so uh, in the wake of the crisis, uh, a new president, Susan Frederick Gray, worked with our Commission on Institutional Change, 
uh, with um, her vice president, Carrie McDonald, to really transform the hiring culture uh, to bring into the top leadership positions people who reflect the diversity that is already present in our movement and that we want to reflect the future of our movement ever more fully. Uh, uh, this involved a real deep look at all of the subtle aspects of our hiring culture that made it harder for people of color to apply for and receive uh, top leadership positions. It also meant challenging what I see as the really insidious logic of meritocracy. And by meritocracy, I mean the idea that all human beings and all our diversity can be placed in a rank order of merit, uh, one after one after one. And whenever you need a position to fill a position, you're somehow obliged to choose the most quote unquote meritorious individual. Uh, 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 and um, meritocracy as it emerged at places like Harvard in the early part of the 20th century was imagined as an antidote to older forms of structural privilege. Uh, uh, but what has become clearer and clearer with each passing decade is that meritocracy has become one of the primary guises of white supremacy in our society because people with entrenched privilege will always find a way to attain whatever traits or experiences are deemed meritorious. Uh, this is why Harvard undergraduate admission admits about as many people from the top 1% of the US income distribution as from the bottom 60%. Uh, the alternative to meritocracy is a deeper emphasis on community. Rather than singling out meritorious individuals, we look for collaborative groups of people who will together empower one another to lead our communities uh, to, the, to be the best communities we can be. Uh, uh, and um, at several crucial junctures in the Unitarian Universalist story, we've actually chosen teams for positions that had been filled by individuals. Uh, another way to embody uh, the practice of kind of working through those traumas that Cheryl was talking about together rather than imagining that we can do it individually. Uh, so my closing thought for all of you is how can you help Harvard move in this same direction of greater communal accountability in the work that we need to do together? Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and thank you for your reminder of that not yet in the uh, and the uh, uh, exhortation to accept discomfort, to embrace discomfort. So next we'll hear from uh, Professor Karen King. Thank you. Um, and my thanks too to Matt and, and David for organizing this. And um, already I've learned so much from my colleague Cheryl and from Dan, who's, who spoke so much from um, out of and from their work their positions and the, and the work they do at the school. Um, I'm going to try to do the same. Uh, my thought is to talk a bit about white supremacy and anti-racism with regard to space and culture. Um, taking an example from my own field of New Testament and early Christianity, especially the Intro to New Testament course. So I want to take us into the classroom and think about fields and uh, and the kinds of things we do. I want to talk about um, space and culture. I want to start with Kendi's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think a lot of us have been reading that this summer. Um, I've been reading a lot of James Baldwin, who I cannot over-recommend. Uh, it, it's just fantastic. Um, but Kendi's, these two chapters in Kendi really struck me when I thought about how, how I, as a white person, see and can see white supremacy operating in our environment at the Divinity School. Um, Kendi's talking about space. He says white spaces are not understood to be racialized. They're not understood to be white, okay? They are simply normal, okay? And they are superior, okay? The opposite, he says, is the case for black space. In practice, however, if you go to these spaces that have been thus labeled or not labeled, okay, um, quote, we will find good and bad, violence and nonviolence in all spaces, no matter how rich or poor, black or non-black. 
Harvard is arguably, I think it'd be hard to argue against this actually, Harvard is arguably traditionally a white supremacist space. So how do we become effective, effectively anti-racist? This is important to me um, personally, and it's something that is urgent. Um, uh, it's, it, it, yeah, in, in all the ways that, that we must all feel and, and could talk about. At HDS, we are and have been talking about diversity and inclusion. Um, I've been chairing that committee, okay? How is that different, Candy led me to ask, from attempts, previous kinds of attempts at integration or desegre desegregation of space? Um, or how could it be different? Because diversity clearly can be cosmetic, okay? And it's clearly the case that that the question of inclusion um, depends, okay? Who is including, who is allowing whom to be included? Included in what? Um, Kendi criticizes past policy, which he says, quote, integration into whiteness becomes racial pro progress. This is clearly a criticism and something that, that we need to ask ourselves about what we're doing when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. Instead, Kendi talks about racial solidarity, which he defines in a quote, openly identifying, supporting, and protecting integrated racial spaces. To be anti-racist is to equate and nurture difference, to equate and nurture difference among racial groups, unquote. So my question is, how do we do that here in actual practice? Okay, and that's where he, I want to turn to his um, uh, his talk about culture. Okay, um, to address that, okay, let's move the issue of white supremacy with regard to culture. And again, Kendi said, "quote The act of making a cultural standard and hierarchy is what creates cultural racism. The act of making a cultural standard and hierarchy." So white supremacy assumes the universality and superiority of a provincial culture or a set of cultures that are identified with white elites. Okay, so white supremacy assumes universality. It, in its normality, it's talking about humanity, okay? When really it's provincial, okay? It's coming from a place, it's talking out of a place, out of a history and so on and so forth, okay? Um, a culture, a set of cultures identified with whites. Okay, and here Kendi quotes um, Molaf Kenti Asante, quote, the rejection of European particularism as universal is the first stage of our coming intellectual struggle. Okay. There's some really great work uh, being done on that. If you haven't read this great book by um, Chakrabarty on provincializing Europe, uh, go and read. It's somewhat older now, but it's a really, um, it's a great book. Okay. But I would argue that a second move, okay, and one that we can make here is a respectful, that is critical constructive engagement with cultural difference. For me, a respectful engagement with difference and with cultural difference means critical constructive engagement. It's not a matter of just bringing in, accepting, or naming, but really a deep engagement. So if we turn now to look at New Testament early Christianity, which is my field, okay, and especially my field is working in, uh, in the early centuries of Christianity with not only the New Testament, but with a broader range of literature. I've worked in particular on talking about how to include texts that were left out, that were marginalized, have been recently discovered, how we have and work more voices um, into the tradition. But the question I want to talk about today is what would that look like in an introduction to New Testament studies? Okay, and the first thing is to realize that in the 20th century, New Testament studies at elite universities and seminaries in the US, certain methods of biblical interpretation had, that had been developed largely, okay, in European and, and US university contexts were, and to a large degree, they still are the privileged methods, okay? the privileged way you do biblical interpretation. These methods then institutionalize, they programize, and they reinforce white supremacy by making these cultural traditions the almost sole foundation 
of the field as such. So you see how this fits back into this notion about, about culture, okay? And the unacknowledged notion that, that these methods and so forth are coming from white culture. They're, in, they're, they're institutionalizing uh, and reinforcing white supremacy. Now, when I came to, um, to HDS about 20 or more years ago, the curriculum clearly centered on Christianity. And we were, at that time, actually, we were pretty innovative, okay, uh, in requiring our students to have some knowledge of what we called world religions, okay? Christianity was not included as a world religion, okay? The world religions were the other traditions, okay? Um, but there's a lot that can be said about that, and, and you'll be hearing a lot about it as you're, during your time here. Um, but it only takes a single second to see how all of this is incredibly odd, okay? Um, Christ followers first appeared in Asia Minor at the crossroads of three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It has early roots in all three, but in modern Western scholarship, Christianity is usually represented Western religion, often in contrast to Eastern religions or indigenous religions and so on and so forth. You can think of all those other kinds of categorizing that we use. But of course, today, Christianity is a global phenomenon and portions of the Bible have been translated into over 2,600 languages, just to give you a sense of that huge breadth of, of, of culture. It's been over 22,000 years, okay, since Jesus lived. And the history of that period is intensely complex and it includes what can truly be called a wide diversity of cultures and of ways of scripturalizing. Okay. So, if one takes a course on the history of Christianity, it now often includes connections with mission, uh, with colonialism, and so on and so forth. But biblical studies, as it is taught in many US universities and seminaries, often relegates these kinds of topics to theology, to mission studies, um, to ministry studies, or to global Christianity, not particularly to biblical studies. Um, uh, the best-selling book for the introduction to the New Testament, written by Bart Ehrman, is an introduction into Euro-American Euro methods of biblical interpretation, focusing on the New Testament and related literature within the context in which they were first composed and read. That is to say, it focuses on introducing students to understand the books in the New Testament in terms of the ancient Mediterranean world during the early Roman Empire, more or less, you know, 1700 to 2000 years ago. Certainly other kinds of interpretations and approaches are now included in intro courses, but they tend to be marked as such, you know, um, Asian interpretation, African American interpretation, feminist, post-colonial, so on and so forth. So within this kind of frame, contemporary interpretations the way people actually live out, practice, work out of scripture, as well as almost all of the 2000 year history of the use of scriptures and its practices uh, globally uh, for, you know, as I said, almost 2000 years, aren't, simply aren't taken up. Um, they are, um, uh, and I'm thinking like, like, um, like music, like sermons, um, uh, inter theology, systematic theology and so forth. These are often deemed anachronistic or quote unquote the theological. And often when the word theological is used, um, it's used in a negative derogatory sense as something that is not scientifically objective like historical critics. Now, part of this is gone, okay? And some, some people will rightly, absolutely rightly say, oh, that's all past. But, but I think we need to, we need to take five or six or seven or a hundred, you know, um, nods and look at that, okay, and, and ask ourselves, like, how, how gone that gone is. Now, there is a lot going on to change all of that, and much more. I just want to talk today about one approach that I find particularly helpful. And here, the book that sparked this for me, and the book I can recommend to you, is called They Were All in One Place. They were all in one place. This is an edited volume, uh, edited by Randall Bailey, Tatsang Benny Liu, and Fernando Segovia. 
uh, this is being taped and recorded, so I hope you can go back and get those names, but the title you can find anyway. Um, they were all in one place. So what they talk about is minority biblical criticism, okay? Now, I want to be really super careful, okay, that we don't then say, oh, this is the way minorities do biblical criticism, okay? And I want to say this is something that I would call radical contextualizing, okay? Um, and it is applicable, I think, not only to biblical studies, but to the humanities in general, okay, for all groups, methods, topics, things you could take to, I would, I think, probably practically anything okay, that one wants to study. And what this involves is contextualizing, putting things in context, okay? The social, the political, the theological, the ideological, the historical, the material, the economic, go on, okay? Get your adjectives in there, okay? All of these kinds of contexts. But they're suggesting we look at three things in particular, and this is where Intro the New Testament works really well. First is text the writings of the New Testament. Secondly, um, the uh, interpreters, which is oneself and others who are doing the interpreting, contextualizing. And thirdly, method and theory. Now, the first is regularly done in New Testament studies, okay? For example, the literature of the New Testament texts are examined in their context in the ancient Roman imperial Mediterranean world. Time, place, history of composition and dissemination, including topics that seem very contemporary, like Roman imperialism and colonialism, slavery, sex gender protocols, okay, the understandings of the way that sex and gender were constructed and were working and were operating. Religion in this period was not a separate domain of life, but was fully implicated in familial, political, social, domestic life. I mean, it's just so helpful to ask, what does it, what does it mean? How are, are we reading the New, text, New Testament texts as literature that were composed in a slave society, in a colonialist society? Um, and what does this mean? How, how does this affect our reading as, a, as opposed to other kinds of ways of reading? But contextualization also asks, where did the New Testament as a collection of literature come from? When? Who decided? What was in it? What does it look like physically as an object? And of course, this is really great because our fantastic librarians at Harvard Divinity School can assemble for us Bibles from every century. Well, the, okay, the first and second, we don't have anything from the first century, okay? And we, in the second century, okay. But after that, okay, we've got, we've got ancient papyrus fragments. We have Bibles from every continent, okay, and every century. And they're just marvelous to look at. Forms changed over time. And the question is, um, what difference does that make? You know, what the actual physical thing, okay? How it's read and how it's interpreted. And who could read anyway? If most people couldn't read, then, then what's going on with, with, with Bible? What about oral traditions? What impact did they have? And so much more. All of this is extremely exciting. And it's part of um, contextualizing A which is text. But now if we go to contextualizing interpreters, the self and others, that's not the only context, okay? Also equally important is contextualize ourselves and the people we're reading, but I wanna talk about us for a minute, okay? You, for example, okay? As a particular interpreter or reader of the New Testament literature, assume, we have to assume we come with widely different assumptions and aims. That's fine, okay? That's who we are. In contextualizing ourselves, the notion is to pay attention to where each of us is coming from and to value that location, to value the resources each person brings to biblical interpretation, including what are the important questions to ask? What, pers what perspectives are important to attend to, okay? Um, we're going to have different notions of this. The set of questions has to be broad. Not a list, you know, like we always used to contextualize it, oh, I'm a white, I'm a white feminist from Montana, okay? But ha they have to be deep exploration, a place of history, political context, social life, ideological assumptions, theological commitments, and more. 
and not least for our topic today, the context and the effects of white supremacy and our engagement involved with them. And as Cheryl just told us, our, the trauma that we bring, the white supremacy, the way in white bodies and black bodies and brown bodies, um, this is all involved when we come to these. All of this folds into all three areas of contextualization. The third area is, is um, a topic of considerable conversation in the contemporary academy, but it's very rarely looked at in biblical studies in this way. And that is contextualization of theory and method. This is where assuming that the methods that have come to us from, from European and American criticism are the methods, okay? And we can do the history of them, but now we need to go beyond just saying, oh, so-and-so invented uh, the two source theory of gospel criticism. In, we need to go past that, okay? And we need to ask what assumptions undergird the undergird form or inform interpretation. What approaches are preferred in particular settings and include a wide variety why? For what ends? Methods, I think, are tools tools that we devise to do certain kinds of work, to answer certain questions, to build, and to reinforce certain kind, kind, kinds of constructions, including constructions like white supremacy, okay? Whether that's an historical interpretation, a denominational creed, resistance to white supremacy, or other kinds of, of oppression or whatever. The thing is that tools reveal certain things and they hide others. So the issue is to give method and theory the same kind of critical analysis as other kinds of contextualization. If a method or theory is a tool, what was or what is its purpose? Whose purpose does it serve? Are the assumptions and the goals made transparent? Do we understand the limitations of a particular tool? Okay. Do we understand the intended and unintended consequences made subject to critical analysis and to creative innovation? The idea is to determine or devise what methods and theories are going to be most helpful for your goals, okay? So what tools do you need to do the work you've come here to Harvard Divinity School to do? How do you see what work they're actually doing? How do you, how do you get at those? How do you understand yourself and the work you're doing? Now, to step back from the course, of course, each of these could be a lot of work, a lifetime of work, okay? Um, in any class one takes, you're gonna get like practically nothing, okay? But the goal, okay, of like an intro class is to learn about and engage with the New Testament, about writings about it with your fellow classmates. And what I do though, is in addition to that, in addition to learning something about the New Testament, which I think is a perfectly reasonable expectation for a course called Introduction to the New Testament, okay? Um, I encourage students to cultivate a habit of asking certain kinds of questions to everything, everywhere. What is the evidence, evidence of? Who gets to say what counts as evidence? What work is it doing? For whom? To what ends? With what effects? What's at stake? For whom? Why? What differences make a difference? who or what is absent, what don't we know, what can't we know? And I give two thoughts. Actually, there's three. Okay, I added one. Um, first of all, if it's not complex enough, it's not true. Secondly, power is everywhere. And thirdly, the ethical is paramount. So what does any of this have to do with white supremacy? I think if we attend carefully, um, put in place the processes and structures that enable and welcome change, transparency, deliberation, experimentation, and listening, 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 okay? Um, we can decenter um, but not eliminate, okay, the space and the culture of white supremacy by valuing and respecting a wide range of other views. 
and again, I want to repeat this, respecting to me does not mean uncritical acceptance. Just because it's, it's not white or something, then it's fine. But critical and constructive engagement with all and everything. That includes the traditional methods. Now, however, shorn of their immunity to criticism. They've been immune to criticism because we just know they're the right ones, okay? It means the classroom as a space of learning is vigorous, experimental, and exciting. And finally, some unasked for advice. Write out of love. Learn in places where there is joy and beauty, as well as places out of darkness and pain. Take care of yourself. You have a mind, a body, and a soul that's worth it, worth caring for and nurturing. So enjoy. Have a good year. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for those, uh, for those, those final words, but for also your, your um, critical uh, critical in both senses of that word, um, comments. Uh, I just also, I mean, I'm watching the chat as you're all speaking and interestingly, as you ask questions about, you know, what makes our space possible? How do, what's at stake in it for us? Who gets to decide? And I noticed comments about HGS's relationship to the prison divestment campaign. Um, these, these are live questions for us and ones that we need to keep asking and answering. And I'm grateful to people in the chat who have asked those questions and who are asking um, the school uh, for answers and also for your comments, of course, Karen, thanks. So, uh, Professor Sanchez. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thanks to David, too, for organizing this and for inviting me to join this great panel and talk about an important topic about which there's far too much to say. Um, so the questions that Matt gave us to address in seven to ten minutes, which uh, I'll, I'll aim for, um, are the issue of white supremacy in your area of teaching or research and how it might bear on the study and practice of ministry. So the issue of white supremacy in my area of teaching or research, uh, I, I would have to say is the issue. Um, I teach the Protestant Reformation and later Protestant theologies in critical conversation with theories of the formation of the modern West and secularization. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between the origin of Protestantism as a mode of Christianity and the kind of the coming of the Enlightenment and the coming of uh, the, the, the goal of a secular society, liberalism. All of this is the arena in which contemporary American European white supremacy also emerged at the very same time. Um, 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. 1492, Spain also expels Jews. Um, which is a, a really important and often overlooked moment in sort of the, I mean, I wouldn't want to say the beginning, but maybe the earlier decades of what would become the, the time of reform. Um, in 14, I think 52, you have um, Dum Diversus, which is a papal bull, which basically sanctions the king of Portugal to conquer non-Christians and subject them to perpetual servitude. These things are happening at the same time as the reformations. Um, and I am somewhat ashamed to say that in most of my educational formation up until like embarrassingly recently, I did not, I was not taught to, and I did not of my own accord put these things together. So this reckoning is long overdue in my field, um, which is primarily the field of theology, but I mean, here's a little primer, especially for you incoming students, theology as it exists as a kind of academic discipline is frequently divided into sort of three subsets, one of which is systematic, one of which is historical, and the other is constructive. Um, so one way of getting at this problem of how white supremacy haunts all of this field, but then somehow it, it's like the, I don't know, it's even bigger than the elephant in the room. It's like the air you breathe and never notice or something like that. You could look at systematics and say systematics are traditionally about trying to get the doctrinal teachings right and sort of put them together in a compelling way. Um, so you can see how that kind of effort might fail to pay attention to conditions on the ground and fail to ask questions about who is, who is doing the writing, for whom, for what kind of audience. And one might hope that the historians would then come in and say, oh, you all are forgetting the historical context in which all of this like, uh, you know, abstract thinking is happening, uh, which does happen, 
but I think it's fair to say the historical theologians have been equally um, falling short in failing to recognize particularly matters having to do with race, um, religious minorities, religious disenfranchisement, racial disenfranchisement that haunt all of this. So when historical theologians make their critiques, usually it's about um, forgetting some sort of local context around which a debate happened or like leaving out the interlocutors or failing to appreciate the extent to which a certain theologian may or may not have had um, a, a kind of modern category in mind that you're imposing on them. Uh, very rarely, and I'm talking in sort of the last hundred years here, a, grand, a broad sweep, very rarely do you see somebody saying, we're not even asking questions about how these institutions got formed, who is given authority within them, who is comprising them. Um, so yes, long overdue. The third field of constructive theology is the place where things like race and gender and sexuality tend to crop up, but I know that I picked up um, very subconsciously for many years, the idea that constructive theology is somehow less good, like less rigorous or something like that. They're not doing real systematics or they're not doing real historical theology. And you still see giants in the field of theology saying the stuff as recently as last week, right? Or, you know, last month. Um, I mean, I won't name names, but there's been big conversations on Twitter about saying like, oh, this identity theology is not real theology. Um, so I guess the, the question that I want to pose uh, is how do we change that, right? And I don't have the easy answer, um, certainly not in like five more minutes. But, um, but what I want to suggest is that this change is not about merely inclusion. Um, that's probably obvious to most of you. It's not about um, just adding people to the syllabus, um, people of color, um, women, et cetera. It has, to, it has something fundamentally to do with rethinking our very approach to the field methodologically. And I know that as I've come to realize this and have at least the inkling of some ideas about how to do this, I have benefited from reading and privileging and submitting myself to the authority of black and indigenous people of color authors within the field of theology who have been working relentlessly to be heard and to do this kind of good work. Um, and people outside the field of theology, um, people working in black studies, people working in post-colonial studies, um, recent critical histories, which is something that I'm very interested in, this question of how history itself gets written. And, uh, and by the way, as I'm you know, critiquing the field of theology, the other thing I do, which is secularization theory, it's extraordinarily rare even in that context to see anybody talk about colonization. You can read Hans Blumenberg's giant, I am talking like a big book, The Legitimacy of the Modern Age, and I've done a word search for the word colonialism and it's not there, it's really astounding. So this is a, it's a systemic problem, as we all know, surprise, surprise. Um, so what I wanna do in my last couple of minutes is talk about how one might reapproach this field. And I wanna talk about, um, I think two, two, uh, problem, too tempting, but I think less advisable methods for critiquing and rethinking theology. And then one that I want to recommend as an important way forward. And I think this will lead me ultimately to the question of ministry and how ministry fits in with this. So I'm going to start by just um, telling a brief story about my most recent thinking with this with some students. So this summer, uh, so a student actually that I met when I taught IMS a couple of years ago um, approached me about doing a reading and research, which she organized and helped lead. Uh, I don't know if she's out there today because I can't see your wonderful faces, but if you are, hi, Tony. Um, and it's on Christian supremacy and white supremacy. That was the topic. So this came out of a, a question that as I've been making deliberate efforts to um, talk about white supremacy and race more explicitly in my classes, I often find students and myself who want to know how can we read kind of the normal as you know, as some of my colleagues have said that, that whiteness codes is like normal, right? So how do we read the normal theology with an eye to how it can sort of, is there something baked into it that leads to racial inequalities, that leads to hierarchies and that leads to a, a posture and attitude of supremacy in general? Um, and so is there some way that there's like a secret, um, like contagion built into theologies that replicates in these material ways, even though the theology itself may not mention and often does not mention race or white supremacy at all. So we decided to ask this question about um, white supremacy and particularly the idea of Christian supremacy. And is, is all of Christianity inherently supremacist? Are there modes of Christian theology that are structurally more supremacists that actually assert a kind of um, 
domination that has a totalizing effect on all systems of the world and then therefore will sort of in a white supremacist world end up replicating white supremacy and if that's the case is christian supremacy just the exact same thing as white supremacy or are they distinguishable and if they're distinguishable then to what extent is that a useful thing to do is there some way that we can distinguish them and then you know critique one and then critique the other and is there like is there a, a non-supremacist Christianity that might be salvageable at the end of this process? So those are the kinds of questions that we started with. And very early, we ran into a lot of methodological problems. Um, like, for example, can you, can you separate out explicit Christian supremacist writing from implicit? And you could ask the same question about white supremacists. Do you read like explicit white supremacist literature in order to better understand something like a presidential speech from 1956, to use you know, a random example? What, like, does that work? If you read the explicit stuff, does it help you understand the code of the implicit stuff? Um, we were skeptical as to whether that could work um, because they're different registers. And this is kind of what I'm trying to get at is that I, what I'm trying to suggest is that what we need to do to actually rethink this field is rethink ourselves as holistic kinds of people. We are not just rational detached brains that can analyze concepts and find the magical argument that's going to somehow end this system of violence. Um, and this is something that a lot of anti-racist educational literature that's come out in the last couple of years is also um, suggesting that it's not about like, if I can just find the perfect argument or like find the perfect outline of the bad thing and take it out, then we can have, we can have something that's holistic and healing and not violent anymore. Um, so, so basically, as we started to read theology, we began to question our search for arguments and, and the focus on that. Obviously, arguments are important, but, but we didn't want to do like a, a limited search for the perfect kind of bad argument so that we could have a good argument or defeat it. But then the other thing that came to the fore, which I really appreciated Cheryl's comments, because this is getting at the issue of trauma and the embodiment of racial trauma in particular and, and paranoia. So, um, in some fields of queer theory, there's uh, there's a the Eves uh, Kasavsky Sedgwick has this article on paranoid reading, and we realized that we were in danger of doing a paranoid reading, of reading these theological texts, um, and just like looking for where's the really bad part so we can pull it out. And if you do a paranoid reading, I mean, I think there's some benefit to like a moment of paranoia, but just like in life in general and community in general, you can't just give in to paranoia or you will become alone and you won't have connections with people. So there's got to be another way to face up to these histories, to put together the historical side of theology with the systematic side, with the constructive side, um, with open eyes, without succumbing to the kind of rationalized isolation of paranoia. And, and the, the flip side of this that Sedgwick recommends is reparative readings. Um, I would add to that that reparative readings come out of a posture um, that's attuned to the conditions of loss and melancholy and uh, mourning. Uh, th that they're able to face up to these giant gaps that cause pain, that cause discomfort. And this will be read differently by people with different racial um, bodies, with different racialized backgrounds, with different economic backgrounds. But to create a space where the act of reading theology not only looks for places where you can locate loss and absence and violence in these texts themselves, but then to be able to flip that back onto a holistic reading of the self that's reading theology. Theology is not just something that exists out there that I read with you know, the executive function in my brain or something. It's something that is a two-way street. When I read it, it affects my body. And what kinds of affect am I bringing to that reading? So I, Again, don't have all the answers, but I've learned from people that I've been reading recently. Um, Joseph Winters is an example. Um, also, I've been reading The Melancholy of Race by Anne Chang. Um, I think that there's a way to create a reading space where we bring in histories that aren't just the histories we've learned, although they are, but also the histories we've experienced and ask, what does theology do to respond to that? And how do we then as, as actors ourselves respond to those gaps in theology itself. So theology, I think in short, I'll, I'll use this as my summary. Um, I, theology is something that we make and it's something that we wear and we put on 
and it changes with the different kinds of bodies that engage it. And um, I think that it's really important to recognize that it's something that will hurt when it doesn't fit right. And so part of the job of the reader and the teacher and the scholar is to make it fit right when it doesn't. So I'll leave it at that and I look forward to questions. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, again, uh, the talks are all kind of cohering around questions of openness to loss and discomfort and, um, and to, to reckoning with uh, a traumatic history. Uh, so thanks, Michelle. Uh, Professor Kahn. Uh, thanks, Matt and David, for inviting me. I want to contribute to this panel by answering two questions, which I hope uh, will be relevant to our discussion. The first question is why I was recruited here at Harvard, and the second, how my research, teaching, and other community-based activities contribute to promote a better understanding of African Islam. Why was I appointed to the professorship in Islam in Africa at Harvard? The short answer is to remedy the neglect of Africa in Islamic studies. Since the 19th century, when the Western Academy became interested in the study of Islam, until the late 20th century, most Western Islamists have assumed that the Muslim world could broadly be divided into two zones, a center, which is the Middle East North African region supposed to have a rich Islamic intellectual tradition and a periphery, including regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, which was assumed to be marginal. So until the 21st, until the turn of the 21st century, most scholars teaching Islam specialized in the MENA region, and 90% of all books published on Islam by major university press dealt with the North, North Africa and the Middle East. So Islamic studies was to a large extent Middle Eastern religious studies. Yet in terms of demography, the Middle East North Africa region represented only 20% of the global Muslim population. The remaining 80% of Muslims lived in other region. In addition, although the Arabic language originates from the Arabian Peninsula, it has served as language of instruction and scholarship for non-Arab Muslims, Jews, and others since the beginning of the expansion of Islam in the 18th century. So non-Arabs, it must be noted, authored the majority of Arabic and Islamic texts. And uh, just like other imperial languages, such as English or French, were adopted in the rest of the world. Today, for example, 54.7% uh, of French speakers reside in Africa. So anybody who is interested in French studies should bear that in mind. This now leads me to discuss how my position was created at Harvard. In the aftermath of, of September 11th, Al-Walid Ben Talal, a Saudi prince very much committed to promote understanding between Muslims and the West, endowed many centers and chairs in Europe and in the US to promote the study of Islam and also other centers in the Arab world to promote American studies in order to foster mutual understanding between Muslim and the West. At Harvard, Al-Walid Ben Talal endowed several positions for the study of contemporary Islam. And to make sure that the Middle Eastern bias would be corrected and Islam would be studied in its diversity, the agreement between him and Harvard University was that only one of these positions uh, will be devoted to the Middle East and North Africa and the others to other regions of the Muslim world. So I was appointed to one of those positions to promote the study of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa, and especially its intellectual history. In particular, the intellectual mission of my position was to contribute to the study of the contributions of Black Africans to Islamic intellectual history. So this requires, first and foremost, deconstructing the thesis or the myth of the so-called Black Islam. What is the thesis of Black Islam? It posited a racial and geographical divide between the pristine Arab rational Islam of North Africa and the Middle East and the magical, mystical Black Islam in which illiterate Sub-Saharan African uh, worshiped wonder-working Muslim Sheikh. In the last three decades, path-breaking works have been produced to discredit the thesis of Black Islam. And some of these have been produced by Harvard graduates, our graduates who, who now have become colleagues. 
a few more of our students are completing their doctoral work on African Islam and show promise to make greater contribution to Islamic studies and to continue to discredit the Black Islam thesis. Now, in my own research, I have also contributed to this endeavor, including my book, Beyond Timbuktu, an intellectual history of Muslim West Africa, which was published in, uh, in 2016, and which shows that Timbuktu is famous as a center of Muslim learning from the Golden Age, yet it is only one among many scholarly centers that uh, existed in pre-colonial uh, West Africa. Now, in addition to my teaching and contribution in training doctoral students, I have also initiated a number of activities to promote a better understanding of Islam in Africa, including an annual conference on Islam in Africa. Uh, and uh, four such conferences have already been convened in the middle, in, at the Divinity School. The first, Text, Knowledge and Practice, the Meaning of Scholarship in Muslim Africa was convened in February 2017. The second, New Directions in the Study of Islamic Scholarship in Africa in, in October 2017. The third annual conference, West Africa and the Maghreb in September 2018. And the fourth, Africa Globalization and the Muslim World in uh, 2019. And we are now in the process of planning the fifth conference. Now, why does Africa matter in the study of Islam and indeed the Abrahamic faith? Because the center of gravity of those religions is now moving to Africa. At the beginning of the 20th century, the overwhelming majority of Christians and Muslims lived respectively, respectively in Europe and Asia. According to historical estimates from the World Religion Database, there were 11 million Muslims and just 7 million Christians in Sub-Saharan Africa at the beginning of the 20th century. Between 1900 and 2010, the number of Christians soared almost 70-fold to 470 million, and the number of Muslims from an, from an estimated 11 million in 1900 to 234 million in 2010, just uh, south of the Sahara. Now, if we add Muslims of North Africa, we reach a number close to that of Christian in the continent, and now roughly adherents of Islam and Christianity are estimated at nearly 500 million each in the African continent. And looking ahead, Islam and Christianity will continue to grow faster in Sub-Saharan Africa than in any other region of the world. Now, the shift in the regional concentration of the global uh, Christian population is driven by a combination of factors, including fertility, age, migration, etc. And by, by 2060, it's estimated that 40% of all Christians would be from Africa south of the Sahara, from 26% in 2015. Now, as far as Islam is concerned, it is estimated that by 2050, the number of Muslims worldwide will grow from 1.6 billion uh, in 2010 to 2.76 uh, billion, almost 30% of the world population. The share of the world Muslims who live in Sub-Saharan Africa will increase from 15% in 2010 to 24%. 0.3%, uh, and Asia, which is currently home to more of the world Muslim population, 61% now, will continue to host a majority of the world Muslims, albeit with a smaller share, only 52%. Now, it's not just in number that we can evaluate this global shift of religion, but it is also in, in uh, commitment. In 2010, the Pew Charitable Trust and the Templeton Foundation conducted a major public opinion survey involving more than 25,000 interviews in 19 languages. And one of the findings is that Sub-Saharan Africa is the most religious region in the world in terms of people, uh, how important is uh, religion in the uh, life of these people. Now, Another hat that I wear at Harvard Divinity School, as uh, Matthew uh, kindly said at the beginning, is that I am the denominational counselor to Muslim students. And as such, I have been hosting a worship and study circle outside campus for the last several years in which I expose participants to the African, now global tradition of Sufism. I also invite chaplains and imams, as well as academics who publish new and path-breaking books on Islam in Africa to speak to our community, which includes 
graduates and undergraduate postdocs and even some Muslim faculty and uh, and uh, so to learn about African Islam and why it's important to, for them to know about us African Islam because black Muslims routinely experience racial prejudice from other Muslims and Imam and Muslim leaders raise often these in uh, this issue in Muslim communities and the reason is that they don't know uh, much about African Islam because they were raised in families that know very little about African Islam and have many wrong assumptions about it. So in our study uh, and worship circles, we try to expose uh, students to African Islam in order to correct uh, those uh, misunderstandings. So I think that I will stop there here my comments and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Usman, uh, for, your, for your words and for showing how, um, how, how race impacts both scholarly and, and religious communities on the ground. Um, so we have about 40 minutes left for this, this session. You know, there have been some comments in the chat, um, but I, I think I may have missed some. And um, so I think the most efficient way to get questions asked and answered is if you ask a question in the chat and would like still to ask it, please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to speak out loud or write it in the question, the Q&A box, um, and I can read it for you. Um, uh, or if you did not write a question in the chat but would like to ask a question now, you can raise your hand or, or um, write it in the Q&A box. Um, so we had one question that was in the Q&A box, and I think this was actually submitted while you were talking, uh, Cheryl. Um, uh, you're asked if you could unpack the, the, white, the trauma up on the white body uh, that I think you were taking from Resma Menachem. Um, you can unmute yourself, I think, if you'd like, and then answer just yeah, a little sure. more of what you mean by white body. Uh, so um, what I'm referring to is a kind of detachment that uh, many white people struggle with in terms of understanding white privilege and white supremacy. Uh, it's almost like it's, uh, it's a, another terrestrial form. Uh, there's a disconnect between um, themselves and uh, the, the experience of trauma. I think uh, uh, Michelle said something, I wrote this down because I thought this was fabulous. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's, white supremacy is the air you breathe and never notice. Uh, and that's the power of trauma, how trauma is embodied. Uh, for all of us, uh, our experiences are intergenerational, sort of family, generational trauma or experience over the years. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, if you want to do some more reading on this, read Monachman's book, but also take a look at epigenetics. It talks about how uh, DNA material is inherited uh, and passed on through generations and uh, without us having any control or investment in it or any ability to, to make that happen. Uh, so let's see, what's an example of it? So um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give an example uh, uh, from a book that I just wrote that's coming out on December 8th. This is a good way to sort of uh, advertise the book, I guess. The book is Black and Buddhist. Uh, how Buddhist, what Buddhism can teach us about race, resilience, transformation, and freedom. Uh, I wrote a chapter, when I started writing this chapter, it was about trauma. There were about seven or eight of us that are writing about how we came to Buddhism and uh, what influenced it. And for me, the influence was uh, feeling the ongoing, uh, ongoing racism and oppression uh, um, in, in my in my daily living, school, everywhere I went, and showing up in white spaces uh, because my parents thought they were working class. They thought that was a good place for me to be, to get ahead. And while that, that I did get ahead in some ways, but tremendous isolation, uh, tremendous uh, lack of uh, self-confidence, tremendous um, uh, inability to make, uh, sort of to, to dot the lines uh, from watching uh, Martin Luther King and uh, some of the other civil rights activists getting hosed down by Bull Connor in the 60s to um, understanding what impact that had on my ability to even attend a white school. So I guess what in, in this book that I, I write about uh, how uh, my mother's early experience of trauma uh, was really difficult for her back in the 30s and uh, that it never was dealt with and it got passed on to my sister and me. 
and it was, uh, you, you can read, you can read the article, but it basically has to do with uh, a sexual assault she experienced in, in the thirties. Nobody ever was talking about that in the thirties. I know, actually, I know quite a few older women who have actually had that, that experience uh, and people still are resident, are reticent to talk about that today. But that's not anything I looked for, wanted, uh, and my sister's much older than me. That thread, that tiny little thread is passed through all of us in which, you know, this whole, this clustering around uh, really uh, reactions to um, uh, a sense of uh, uh, harm, a sense of um, sort of um, uh, 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 proclivity to be depressed. Uh, and so th this is very subtle, which is why I think the field of epigenetics is just so powerful in terms of what's tr transmitted through DNA. It has nothing to do with what you're able to control or not control. It's just there. And so then our task is to how do we, how do we work out of that? How do we work to heal ourselves? And it involves a lot of different things. So Resma has a, uh, Menachem has one idea. And then if you're interested in this, you can take a look at um, Internal Family Systems, IFS, which also talks about the parts of us, those parts that show up from that uh, inherited uh, gene that, that pop up. So what I'm particularly, what I wanna underscore and I'll stop talking because there are other questions is, I think for white people, accepting that, that there is white body trauma is just significant. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of students over the years and they say, well, you know, I haven't done anything. I didn't bring this on. This is not my problem. This is my parents. I mean, the point is, and this is really a legitimate evidence-based um, field, that this does in fact happen, that you inherited, you, of your, not of your doing, uh, the, the, the construct of whiteness and all the privileges and uh, the dominance and power that goes along with that. So the task is, how do you undo that? And the first thing is really have an awareness that you actually have it and beginning to do some, in, it's a lot of internal work, but it's not something you start and stop, you have to make a commitment to really doing it. I hope I hope that was answered your question. Sure. Could I jump in on this question sure, as right. well, mm -hmm. um, and just you know give a kind of personal testimony about what this, you know, about what the trauma in the white body might mean. Um, so I think there's a particular kind of trauma that you know, as Cheryl was saying, is carried inter intergenerationally in white settler families. Uh, so in my you know in my own family history. There have been three separate moments, uh, once in the 17th century, once uh, uh, after the US Revolution, and once in the late 19th century, where my ancestors moved on to stolen land, uh, and in some cases, exploited that land using stolen labor. Uh, uh, and that meant disrupting, you know, both the rootedness uh, in land that was deeply familiar uh, that we had grown up symbiotically with and disruption of the capacity to do our own work uh, and because uh, all sorts of economic privileges stemmed from the appropriation of of the settler experience i think when we white people think about doing anti-racist work undoing white supremacy it can feel like we're giving up privileges and being left with a void because we've been alienated from land that is that we were truly at home in and alienated from our own physical labor. So I think a lot of the the healing there has to do with, you know, learning to care deeply for particular places. Uh, and and of course, it's always important to remember that the trauma of appropriating land and labor is, you know, is tied up with privilege, uh, uh, you know, whereas people of African descent in this country um, lost their homeland in the same way, but did not get the privilege. So, you know, there's no kind of equation here, uh, but I think the healing work does involve uh, finding ways to be rooted in, in ecological care for places and responsible uh, to embodied uh, labor. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so James Lewis, I think, had his hand up first. And uh, James, if you're there, I'm going to allow you to talk so you can ask your question live. Yes, thank you very much. I um, enjoyed reading uh, the book um, that, that has been referenced several times, um, particularly as it relates to the trauma um, that's been discussed quite a bit that occurs in all bodies. 
Um, but my question is, with um, a situation where white individuals begin to um, hear this 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 explanation of trauma and how the trauma um, actually leads to the imposition of trauma on other bodies, black bodies in particular, um, isn't there a risk that that could go a long way toward uh, basically absolving them in their own minds? Um, we, we seem to be, as a culture, as an American culture, pretty lazy, and not many of us are going to, um, I think, go through these steps of trying to create more space so that we can um, deal with the trauma. But rather, I, I, I fear that many may say, well, it's not my fault. I too am a victim. So there you are. Is that a real concern that, that some people are having? Thank you, James. Anyone want to respond? Good point, but I'm, I'm going to step back and let somebody else answer it. I have one thought, which is a little bit oblique, but um, well, uh, Cheryl and then Dan were talking about the last question. I was thinking another intersectional layer I would add is uh, patriarchy, masculinity, and the way that especially among, I mean, I'm, my, my people, I guess, are like kind of Irish, German, Im you know, immigrants um, who settled in some way, but you know, never really owned much until recently. But um, I've seen in people I know, and especially a certain demographic of kind of middle-aged white men who are descended from maybe first generation, second generation immigrants, a kind of reference to authoritarian father figure who, who in, inculcated in them that uh, success meant like, you know, the whole bootstrap thing and like achieving a certain kind of wealth, achieving a certain kind of um, property and dominance over others and showing that you weren't like the other, you know, which is usually the black or the racialized brown figure. Um, so addressing trauma um, in, in a actually healing way means like pinpointing that, like the cause of that trauma and learning to recognize it for what it is, which is a form of violence that does victimize the subject, but then also like makes that subject no longer, hopefully, um, uh, perpetuate that. And to recognize the father figure instead of the like, the lordly figure that I've wanted to please and, and all of my honor is wrapped up in that, to recognize that is like the problem and reject that and then find a solidarity with other people that's not based on sameness, but is based at least on the experience of rejecting um, this pattern of trauma. Yeah, if I could, yeah, jump in as well. Um, I think one of the things that, that white people need to really take on and understand is that privilege rarely feels like privilege, privilege because all structures of, impression, of oppression are kind of contingent and fragile. So if you have privilege, you're always kind of conscious of the potential of losing it. So if you don't feel privileged, that's not an excuse to not do the work of undoing the privilege. Uh, feeling like the, the privileges you have are shaky is precisely a reminder, oh, okay, I am one of the people that needs to do this work of undoing my privilege and of, of using my privilege towards the larger uh, uh, cause. And it certainly doesn't involve uh, telling trauma stories for the sake of getting anybody else to feel sorry for us. It's just to clarify for ourselves uh, what the work is of beginning to tell a new story. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so I'm going to read a question here from uh, Nathan Samayo, which I believe was also in the chat. Um, this is for the panelists. Do you think that healing from bodily trauma and generational trauma created from systemic racism should be prioritized over social and political action? Or should they equally slash concurrently be addressed? I understand that they are not completely mutually exclusive, so I'm wondering this. Um, and then he refers to this book that we've talked about, My Grandmother's Hands, which seems to prioritize healing over action. And I just I wanted to, yeah, I think Nathan, and I'm also curious what you all think about what's the relationship between these things, political and social action and individual and personal healing. So, so I'll respond to that um, by saying that, uh, and pick up on Michelle's last point about violence to the body. Uh, I think that the violence uh, that we see uh, social act activism is really important, but I think that it can't be driven by internalized um, violence uh, to the white body or the black body. It has to really be 
um, I think about really um, um, putting both of those things together, that, that healing and transforming what we know as white supremacy and the dominance over us, uh, it, it's, it has to be that we're trying to eradicate that. And um, that I think we it can't, let me, let me just, we can't, we can't just work out of an activist position. We have to have a core uh, of healing and a practice around healing that's gonna really motivate us to really help um, transform all of humanity. Because then outside of that, it becomes kind of an isolated fight. And I think sometimes the, the, with the kind of protests that, that, have, that have happened, um, uh, it's, it's easy to lose, lose sight of what you're trying to achieve and to be in there for the long game, you know, the, the sustainable kind of protest that we need, the, the sustainable action to um, create justice it requires work. Uh, and so I, I, I guess what, what, my, what I fear, what, I, what concerns me is that um, we find ourselves in this place and then uh, people think, okay, I don't like one of, like James or somebody else mentioned, you know, this is a lot of work. Yes, it is a lot of work. But um, my nickel is on doing the internal work, the spiritual formation around transforming and healing uh, as a process to undo uh, um, white supremacy and systematic racism. I think without it, we can't do it. And I think we're still at this point after 400 years because we're not, haven't been able to do, haven't been willing to do the work in a kind of um, concerted, sustainable way. So, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying it's, it's all, everybody else, it, it's also, I'm, I'm in it too. And in, uh, in terms of really trying to work at this uh, in a kind of uh, concerted effort. So I'll tell you qu two, quickly, two things that I've done. One thing is that I'm on Zoom a lot. And so there is some, 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 some uh, good things that have come out of the pandemic. Uh, with, I'm, out, I'm on Zoom a lot with uh, black teachers, Buddhist teachers and leaders from around the country talking about practices, sustainable practices, uh, practicing together, meditation, uh, and talking about what we need to do, creating other forms of figuring out how to disperse money or because we've had access to uh, some, some benefactors that have said, hey, we want to support, su support um, Black Lives Matter projects in certain areas. Second thing I've, I've done is, uh, well, even though I'm on sabbatical, I've committed to a 14-month intensive trauma training uh, and uh, training the trainer, which I hope to bring back to the Divinity School and, and do with students next year. And there are a couple of Divinity Schools that are part of this process, project too, Thomas Mary Dada and uh, Will Guild. And the idea is, and it's, it's a social resilience model. Uh, and the idea is to really, uh, we can do this in sort of group, uh, we're in a group, we can do this in a number of different ways. But it's to help people really get beyond, you know, the resilience is one piece, but beyond, get beyond the resilience so that you can really kind of move and transform on whatever communities or structures or organizations that you're working in. So that, but, but I think we only can do this work if we work together. It has to be some sort of um, really sustained, committed work that we do together in a community. And maybe our community is small at, at, at HGS, but, but maybe even breaking it up into smaller pieces where people make a commitment to work with each other around this throughout the year. I always agree with what Cheryl says because she's always right. So um, <laughs> I want to emphasize that, you know, um, at the same time, for my own experience has been that the two are so intertwined um, that it's sort of, it's sort of hard, it's, it makes it a hard question to answer. And I think we have to have both. We have to have, you know, action because action is what we do bodily and that bodily action that we do as, as activists transforms the interior life. Okay, at the same time that part of the damage, an extensive amount of the damage that's done is because of the structural institutionalized, um, you know, racism and white supremacy stuff out there. And if we don't change that, the harm continues to be done and we become, continue to be soaked in it. So, so they belong together. They, they belong together and different people are going to need to do different pieces of that work at different times. They're gonna be better at different parts of it than others. And to be allied with people who are doing all of the work seems to me to be ex extremely important. But if we ignore, if we just do social activism and ignore that important interior work or just do the interior work and say, oh, well, once at the end of that, then the structures will take care of themselves. Um, I, th I think that's, that's not right because we are bodies who act in the world. Um, and so those two go together for me. Thank you. You, you know, I think, oh, no, ahead, Matt, can I just add one quick thing, Matt? Yeah, please, sorry, go ahead, yeah, sorry, please. So, so one of the things in terms of culture, uh, I think it's gonna be important this year, 
uh, at HES is to try to create some um, brave spaces. Uh, this comes from Mickey Scott Bay, who, who uh, came up with a uh, sort of a structure uh, container for these kinds of conversations. And um, there aren't really safe spaces, but there are brave spaces. And with them in the brave spaces, we can create a kind of um, acceptance, openness, uh, willingness to hear each other and not be PC. So, uh, you know, politically correct, that we can, can kind of bring our concerns within there. So I think sort of creating a container is going to be really important in terms of what happens this, this year in, in, the, in, in doing this work. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, you know, I think this balancing act that we're talking about is very parallel to the balance between the work we do in transforming our own community as HDS and the work we do in supporting efforts to confront white supremacy in the larger society. And, you know, Karen said that oftentimes the two go hand in hand and the issue of prison divestment uh, that many of you have been raising in the chat is just a perfect example of a place where the internal work comes together with the external work because it turns out uh, we as a community are deeply implicated in one of the big evils of white supremacy that might seem to be uh, outside of us. And in quick answer to the question of what HDS has done, I know that many of us on the faculty as individuals have signed petitions putting ourselves on record for prison divestment. And I know that many, many HDS students have been in the leadership of those organizations. Uh, but I think there's a big open question about whether there's more we could do uh, to act collectively and not simply as sets of individuals, especially on the faculty side, there's more we could do. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for bringing us back to that, um, that important uh, comment in the chat. So uh, Ella Hartley, um, I'll read her question. Uh, thank you all for your thoughts, time, and labor today. How have you all planned to interrupt white supremacy, culture, microaggressions, et cetera, in your classes this year? Well, I, I, um, I kind of thought that's what I was doing in my talk, okay? <laughs> um, you know, as a way to talk about how changing, changing pedagogy really, really works. Now, I'm not actually teaching in the fall, so I um, am going to spend a lot of the fall term thinking about the ways in which the reading I have been doing about anti-racism work and white supremacy can work in the classroom and also about how um, our distance learning techniques um, that we're all learning could actually um, be used um, in much better ways to create different kinds of space, you know, um, but also, um, you know, working around different different cultural kinds of materials. So it's really taking the, the this technique that um, is being introduced um, by my colleagues in minority biblical criticism um, and seeing what happens here at school. But, but students in the past have already noticed that it makes space, it makes place. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, it's not a very good answer, but yes. Thanks, thanks Karen. Yeah, Dan, please. Yeah, one of the things that I do is I put into my syllabi a counter oppression policy that basically states both that we as a class have a shared responsibility uh, to create the space for everyone's voice to be fully heard. And that I as a professor have some special responsibilities uh, to make sure that the structure of the readings and so forth uh, are truly welcoming of the full diversity of, of the participants. and. And the reason I put it in the syllabus is to let people know that when they see a microaggression or problematic dynamic, uh, they are empowered, invited to bring it to the attention of the whole class or to the attention of me personally, you know, depending on the particular flavor uh, of the incident and, and who, you know, bears primary responsibility for addressing it. Uh, and some of you in this audience I know have been in a previous class where we did really work through that whole process where something happened uh, and a particular student had the courage to say, hey, this is in violation of our counter oppression policy. Let's spend some real class time working through it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, I know I'm not a panelist, but if I could just say, Ella, I'm really, I really appreciate your language and your, in your question like about uh, interrupting white supremacy, that, that the question assumes that 
you know, as many of our panelists have said, that white supremacy is is the language we speak already, and it needs to be interrupted. Um, and so, one thing I'm doing, and you know, I said, as I said, this is this class or this meeting today is taking place at the first IMS class. One of the reasons we're having this meeting instead of the first IMS class is to interrupt um, white supremacy. It's also why, in the past, our class, you know, Harvard started as a school for for ministers. The Puritans, the Pilgrims, started as a school for ministers, and so we have traditionally in IMS tied our meeting as Introduction to Ministry Studies to that history of Harvard's founding. Uh, and this year we're gonna start in other places. We're gonna start with Resma Menachem and that's discussion about white supremacy. We're gonna start with um, the Wampanoag peoples and the people who were here before the Puritans arrived um, and talk about the Wampanoag language reclamation project, which happens just down the road from me here in, in, on, on Cape Cod. So, um, are those, so those are some of the you know, structural or, or I guess organizational things that Dan was saying, but I think all of us are, are hopeful to, to, to also invite students uh, to speak up and, and to uh, support students in sort of counter oppression um, uh, uh, policies and practices in our, in our courses. Any others? Um, but from the from the framework of theology, one thing I've tried to do, um, I, I guess apropos to the things I said earlier, a concrete example is, like I teach this course that I taught last semester. I'm not teaching this year, by the way, so this is from last semester, but I teach um, Calvin, Schleimacher, Bart, and Cohn. And I know, you know, Cohn's coming at the end for chronological reasons. Um, but one of the things I try to do to anticipate the kinds of microaggressions that inevitably come out when we get to Cone is emphasize all along the way that the first three authors we're reading, who are widely considered canonical giants of Protestant theology, are individuals with political concerns who are writing in many cases for their particular community and who are deploying theology in a way that's responsive to those concrete concerns. So when we get to Cone and you get the inevitable comments about like, oh, this is just for black people, this isn't like real universal Christianity or something like that. We have a track record to say no, all along the way, these were particular projects that were deployed for particular purposes and that is what theology is. And then the only other thing I would add to that is, um, I especially try to signal support to students of color um, and any student who wants to, who is willing to be brave and sort of claim their place in this tradition antagonistically or in a complicated way um, but but to show them that i i've got their back if they want to do that obviously i can't ask those students to take on the labor of the course but i try to demonstrate that and then support it when it happens but you know that's that's a start there's always more and i have learned so much i just want to say i've learned so much over the years from my students so for you students out there keep pushing your professors Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I want to second that as well. I was looking for reasons that are important here. I was looking at some syllabi from my first year teaching and I'm frankly embarrassed by them. <laughs> and it's because of the, the students and, uh, and uh, they're, they're teaching me over the past seven years that I, that I have that kind of gracious irritant of those old syllabi. Um, so uh, this is a question from an anonymous attendee. How does HDS's system of grading students perpetuate white supremacy? Will you address the role of power and white supremacy's impact on the grading system? What effort have been taken, efforts have been taken to address white supremacy with grades and the grade appeal process? Any responses? Well, since I inserted myself as a panelist, a quasi-panelist already, I'll just say quickly, I mean, I, um, I think one thing I do in my courses, I, this, is, this is kind of a, uh, an oblique answer to your very dark question. So you can, um, I'll, I may deserve some, discredit for this, but uh, one of the ways that, one of the things I do in many of my classes, especially for students who, for whom this is a terminal degree, for whom the MDiv is a terminal degree, um, is, is, and this is again, I learned from students, is that, you know, as Karen was saying in her comments, kind of Western academic knowledge, or knowledge production, Western knowledge production, as we understand it, is itself a, a norm of European provincialism, right? And so if students want to propose to me other projects than an academic paper, 
I'm I'm so excited about those, right? Um, and if they want to if they want to propose different methods and standards and rubrics by which those alternative projects might be graded, um, I'm very excited about about those as well. And I think I'm not alone on the faculty in, in in that. And again, as I said, especially for students for whom the degree is a terminal degree, and that what they need, as Karen was saying, what they need from this place is to ask the questions they want to ask in the way they want to ask them. And I see my own role as a teacher in, in helping students ask those questions in the way they want to ask them, ask them and get the feedback that they need on, on the answers they come up with. Um, but are there others who want to, to respond to this question about grading? Okay, well, I saw a lot of nodding heads when I was speaking. So, okay, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Dan. I'll, I'll give it a little bit of a try. Uh, um, I'm acutely aware of my own hypocrisy whenever this issue comes up, uh, and uh, and perhaps the hypocrisy is also an awareness that there are many dimensions to it, and it's really complicated. Uh, but at the end of the day, the primary function of grades is to put people in a rank order. Uh, and the only reason you would really want to put people in a rank order is if you had some scarce goods and you wanted to make sure those were retained by a small subset of the larger community. If we really saw ourselves as involved in a common enterprise of, uh, of galvanizing everyone's best gifts, uh, uh, for the good of all of us, we would not need to rank ourselves. We would just need to name our diverse gifts using qualitative rather than quantitative language. But if we really believe this, we would not choose to devote a $30 billion endowment to the, to the education of a relative handful of people, uh, but would see the education of all of us globally uh, as of equal value to our future well-being. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so Jordan V, uh, they ask, what are ways you see some of these sustainable healing practices rising up alongside community care? Do you think it's a realistic hope to use these tools as a way to bring together communities on a large global scale? Well. I mean, the answer to that is yes. Um, and let me just give a shout out to uh, um, Melissa Bartholomew, who is the Associate Dean of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And uh, Melissa knows this stuff well. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy that at a time like this, she is joining us. We, we're really fortunate to have her uh, lead us uh, in and really beginning to look at some of these things and create sustainable ways. Uh, she's done this in many different places, uh, BC Law School, BC School of uh, Social Work, HDS, uh, Harvard Law School. So um, in her presence actually, it's gonna, be, it's, it's gonna be a witness to our ability to stay focused and stay working on this. I mean, she is just an incredible leader and uh, it will take students joining her in, in helping to make the, our culture at uh, HCS sustainable in the practices that we do. Uh, I think there are little things that we can do in classes. Uh, I think, uh, for example, the, 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 the uh, Matt's last comment about doing project, doing projects. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, we need to have some parameters around that, but uh, it's, it's a great way to really kind of open up uh, how students learn and see what they can do with the project or some other way. Uh, one thing that the that school has done is over the years, everybody had to write a thesis. Now that's no longer the case. That's, that's gained momentum and, and become uh, a, a policy now so that students have some choice about how they, the work that they can pull together the work that they're doing. So we, I, I feel like we are moving in the right direction, but we can't do this alone. Uh, and it can't be, well, you're in and you're out, you're in and you're out. If you are really, really committed to change the way things are, uh, you know, uh, in the world, then uh, make sure you're in the right places this year. I mean, unfortunately, we can't be in the same physical space. That's really unfortunate because I think some of the practices that we could do is uh, uh, noon service, there's, that's an opportunity. Uh, we have this also all sorts of committee, committees and com community gatherings that we can partake in, but we can make, we have to make Zoom work and really support each other around transformation. 
Uh, and, and we can begin just by paying attention, paying attention and then and, and paying attention to what's happening to inside you and where you, my father would say, where you lay your shoes, where, you, where, where are you going to put your shoes? You know, where are you going to really make a commitment to stay with what's happening in terms of the transformation project that we're trying to uh, build this year? So that, that's, that's, that's all I can say about that. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and I'll just have one comment as well. And this is, Dan and I talked about this in a class that you visited, of mine that you visited last year, but Jordan asked, do you think it's a realistic hope? I, I want to ask what, what's at stake in the idea of a realistic hope, right? Um, is, is the opposite of hope pessimism, like it's not gonna turn out well, or is the opposite of hope despair? And I think if the opposite of hope is despair, then it's not whether or not we realistically think that in our lifetime we can build these large communities. It's whether the alternative to that effort is to give up and despair, right? And to me, that just seems, I, 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 scare, I share your skepticism, Jordan, about the, how, how realistic it is to accomplish these, these goals. Um, but it's, it seems like it's the only thing worth doing. Uh, and so- It's a lifelong goal, right? Right. This is a lifelong goal, yeah. So, um, you know, I've realized I've been neglecting the raised hands function. So, uh, uh, Tamara or Tamira, I'm sorry if, if I've been ignoring you for too long. If you still have your question, I think we have time for one more and I can allow you to talk now if you'd like. Yeah, hi. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, I, yep, you can. Great. Um, I was really struck by Professor Giles's um, comment that we needed a lot more to do um, than reading and learning and continuing and what we're doing. But I was also really struck by Professor McCannon's observation that um, we at HDS have not experienced a crisis yet. Um, many of us can acknowledge that we have a long way to go and we all have a lot of work to do and that we need to change, but there's so much at stake and we all know how difficult it can be to go up against authority. So how do we, especially those white people who hold power, create spaces amongst ourselves to openly challenge the way things are in ways that do not endanger the embodiment, the embodiment of those on the margins? Thank you. Yeah, I'll have one. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much. I feel like I'm talking too much. But let me, let me just say one thing. Uh, I know there is a, um, um, maybe a, a, an urge or a drive to sort of, get out in the street and change the world. But you, let me just say this, and I'll say it in plain street talk. Check yourself. Check yourself. You can, the, 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 the urge is to, let's run out and join, join the march. You could be out there, but make sure you're checking yourself at the same time. Have you done the work? Have you done your own work? Have you checked your biases, your microaggressions? Are you on them all the time, right? We don't need you out in the street if you haven't done your work. It takes both of those things to be out in the street. Otherwise, you're just you're showing you're showing up, but you're not you're not really bringing the full package. Change happens. It happens slowly, <laughs> and I know you want it to happen fast. Most of us that are black have been living in this space for a long time. In my case, 66 years. I was aware of the racism maybe at five years old. Right? Check yourself. I'm checking myself. I'm checking myself around not getting too angry and not wanting to listen to white people. I work on this every day. I worked on this before I got into this conversation. There's a weariness that comes with this. But, but Matt is right, and, and the other person that brought this up, hopefulness, What's, well, this is about hope, right? So my, my thing is, okay, you might wanna call, con, uh, fight big corporations and HDS and change HDS. In order to change HDS, begin by trying to change yourself at the same time. Thank you, Cheryl. Any, any final words in response to this question or in general? Okay, well, it's 501, uh, which I've kept you one minute past your a lot of time. Thank you so much to our panelists, especially, I didn't realize so many of you, I knew, I knew Cheryl was, but I didn't realize so many of you were coming off sabbatical to participate in this, in this uh, event, but I'm glad you did, and I'm glad for your words and for, um, and for your wisdom today. Thank you to all our attendees and uh, to all of you who asked questions. This will be recorded, and we'll post it at some point after we work with um, IT to get it, uh, in the state that can be posted. Um, and if you have further questions, and you know, please, I know that all of us have email addresses on the HDS website, please reach out to folks. Also, if anyone, you know, feels like they need to process this talk for any reason with anybody, uh, our new Dean, Melissa Bartholomew, has offered herself to, to speak with any students who, um, who may need to process some of this content or some of the things you heard today or may 
for whatever reason, if you'd like to speak with Dean Bartholomew, she has made herself available and please do reach out to her because as Cheryl said, we're lucky to have her and, and we're glad to have her with us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Uh, best of luck in the, in the new term. Thank mm -hmm. you.